Hello, everybody. My name is Wisteria Perry. I'm the manager of interpretation and community outreach here at the Mariners Museum and Park. And we're so excited that you're all here to really help us kick off our um, our celebration of Black History Month. And we're starting off with our program here called More Hidden Histories Revealed. And I'd like to introduce you actually to our other uh, presenter today. His name is Winston Favor, and he is the researcher for this program. So don't you come on up, Winston, and uh, join us here, and I will turn everything over to you. Oh, right, well, thank you, Wisteria. Great. Watch yourself there. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry about that. You know, it's been a long, been a long morning, so kind of want to get back. You know, still think it's the morning, but it's the afternoon. So welcome, everyone, to the More Hit, Hidden Histories Revealed program. Um, I'm the researcher, Winston G. Favor. I have lived and breathed this project for the last year. So I was in your I was in your seat last year, and now I'm here. So I am hope I hope that I am able to share with you all some good information that you all would learn and take back with you, and hopefully at the end participate with us because this is a community project that we will need your help with to continue. So with, without further ado, we will get started. And this is the mission of the Mariners Museum. It says the Mariners Museum and Park connects people to the world's waters because through the waters, through our shared maritime heritage, we are connected to one another. So the picture here is from the 1950s and that room was the Great Hall of Steam. If you haven't been here in a while and if you've been here recently, this is where the America's Cup boat is located. Now, for those who might not be familiar with the Hidden Histories Project, let's go over what the project is. So Hidden Histories is a museum project to give names and interpretation of the unidentified African-Americans depicted in our collections. This is a project that the museum is very excited about and will be ongoing. So this is just, this presentation is just the tip of the iceberg and it will be, like I said, it's gonna be ongoing and it's actually will be, um, it'll be helpful for you all to help us as we go through our, this project. So what have we learned in the year since we came before you? We came before you last year. This was the first, this is the picture we first introduced last February. So a year ago, we began our quest to find the names of the 21 men in this picture. So using genealogical research and community help, we were able to find the names. So I'm gonna come into the screen real quick. Let me do a little Vanna White for you. Follow my so excellent expensive finger. We have Mr. Thomas Carey starting in the, in the back from the left, Mr. Thomas Carey, Mr. Albert Carey, no relation, Mr. Mansfield Johnson, Mr. John Wooten, Mr. Alvin Red Cross, Mr. Hanson Tyler, Mr. Arthur Chandler, Haywood Roy, McKinley Banks, he was in the opening picture that you saw, Mr. Joseph Holland, Mr. George Shakespeare Brown, William Wilson, James Scott, Russell East, Thomas Hudgens Jr., Pink Moore, Willie Griffin, Elmo or Elmore Jordan, Ernest Bradley Sr., Dennis Banks, and Selden Diggs Sr. Now, if any of y'all in the audience, if you have a relative that is up here, please put it in our chat. Let us know that he shout him out for us. So aside from names, we've also learned other information about the men. We've learned that most of the men live around the museum in the Morrison area of Newport News. At the time of the museum's founding, Morrison was a part of Warwick County. Some of y'all might know Warwick and Newport News did not merge until the 1950s with consolidation. So at this time in the 1930s, 
it was the city of Newport News and the county of Ward. They attended various churches, including Emmanuel Baptist Church, Second Baptist Church East End, but most attended First Baptist Church Morrison, which was located where, which was located around, let me get back in the screen, which was located around Christopher Newport University right there. I wanna say at the corner of a university place in Warwick Boulevard, but it's now located on Patrick Henry Lane near the airport. And First Baptist Church Denby, which is off of our Campbell Road. We also have Arthur Chandler. He was a member of the Knights of Pythias. So some of the men were actually members of fraternal organizations. And the Knights of Pythias was an African-American order that was started in Richmond, Virginia in 1869 by Thomas W. Stringer. And we also have here, Mr. Albert Carey, Mr. McKinley Banks and Mr. Ernest Spratley were all Prince Hall Masons. Mr. Carey, and Mr. Spratley were members of what was then known as the Zedekiah Lodge number 167, which is now located in York County, which is the York Star Zedekiah Lodge 167. And Mr. Banks was a part of the Bloomin' Olive Lodge number 94. These lodges are still in existence. The Bloomin' Olive Lodge is at the Masonic Lodge off of Chestnut Avenue. So if there are any Prince Hall Masons in the chat, please go ahead and uh, give a shout out in the chat. Now, one of the more interesting stories I was able to find from my research was about Mr. Ernest Spratley Sr. Now, Mr. Spratley was a member of the Warwick County Voters League. If you all know that community organizations, voter leagues sprung up around African-American communities to help pay poll taxes, register voters, and encourage voting. Now, I don't know if you all can see this here, but this is an article from the October 19th 1946 Norfolk Journal and Guide. The Norfolk Journal and Guide gave some good information in this research. If you all might not know, the Norfolk Journal and Guide was one of the African American newspapers in the Hampton Roads area. So here they're talking about the citizens met with the Ward County School Board on the school situation. And they were talking here. Let me see where I want to start. Let's start right here. It said, meeting with the Warwick County School Board on Wednesday night of last week, where eight citizens of the county, Howard Harris, George Parker, Abraham Talkin, Ernest Spratley, George Davis, Alex Etlow, Earl Bird, Willie Austin, and their legal advisor, attorney W. Hale Thompson, which is a well-known well -known lawyer from Newport News, African-American lawyer from Newport News, for the purpose this provided for the purpose provided for Negro pupils in the county. So they were, they were advocating for a school because it goes on to say that at the time Morrison High School was the Negro high school in Warwick County and it was, it was inadequate, it was overcrowded. And in some articles I read, it was actually unaccredited. So they wanted a new school built in Warwick County. Now it says here that the superintendent of the school, T. Rollins Sanford, said they had a 24 track acre track of land located between Jefferson Avenue, extended and Route 17 south of North Newport News. Now, is there anyone in the chat that's out there that can tell me what school this became? It might not have was built on that same track, but it was built on a track of land in Warwick County north of what is now Mercury Boulevard. Okay, I'll give it to you. Is, are there any Carver Trojans on the chat? That became George Washington Carver High School. It was, that's where the principal, well-known principal, Mr. Homer L. Hines was principal for many, many years. And he lived, actually Mr. Hines lived off of Shoe Lane and my father was a 1960 graduate.
So as many people know, there is a connection between the Mariners Museum and the Newport News Shipbuilding. And that connection is also evident here. Many of the men in the photo worked, worked and retired from the Newport News Shipbuilding. Mr. Dennis Banks retired from the shipbuilding, Mr. Ernest Spratley, Mr. Al Mr. Alvin Red Cross, and Mr. John Wooten, and Arthur Chandler. And here are some pictures. Another one is Mr. Hanson Tyler. As you see, this is, this is the picture of Mr. Tyler in 1935. And this is an article from March 10th, 1973 from the Norfolk Journal and Guide. Every so often they were actually picture, they were post the print, excuse me, the photos and a little bit of information about the retirees from the shipyard, tell you how, where they live and how long they have worked at the shipyard. And in this photo, Mr. Mr. Tyler said he has worked there for 29 years and 11 months. Here's Mr. John Wooten, his picture in the photo from 1935 and his article. And it's very interesting, as you can see, Mr. Tyler was there with four gentlemen, but Mr. Wooten has his own article. And then this is Mr. Alvin Redcross, and this is his retirement article with seven other gentlemen. And this is from 1971. Now, not everybody worked at the shipyard. Some people actually stayed with the museum. Mr. Robert Russell East stayed with the museum. Mr. Joseph Holland stayed with the museum and Mr. Haywood Roy. Now, Mr. Roy is one of the gentlemen we were able to trace from beginning to end with the museum. Now, this is his picture that was taken, uh, I wanna say after 1935. This is in, actually in the museum. Mr. Roy is a native of Ward County. He lived on Roy's Lane. Now, I was unsure where Roy's Lane actually was located. From a map I found in the Daily Press, I was thinking it's around the Todd Stadium area. If you know exactly where Roy's Lane was, please drop us a line, an email, let us know so that way we can get that part of the story correct. And it was also interesting that we found his name as Royal on some early official documents. Now I found that interesting because when we first, when I first started contacting some of the family members, they were looking at the picture and the picture that we showed last year had last names on it. And a lot of them said, that's not Roy, that's Royal. And I was thinking, no, it's Roy, because it says it right there on the piece of paper. It says Roy. But as I did more research, I found out his name was Royal. We do not know why his name changed, how it changed. If you do know, once again, drop us a line. We would like to know why the name changed from Royal to Roy. He worked as a janitor here at the museum. As you can see here, this is from the Daily Press. This is when we, the museum was doing a, uh, a sub anniversary show honoring the 62 years of the submarine service. This is Mr. Roy here, and this is James Massenburg. They are preparing, and this is a picture of the Nautilus, which was the first um, atomic powered submarine, and that is, that is something we will get into at a later program. Stay tuned, doing research on that as it is. And I think if I'm not mistaken with Steria, I think this is the submarine we still have in the museum right now. I believe so. Okay. And lastly, Mr. Roy retired in 1968. And this is the picture and from the Daily Press. And yes, they do have an E dropped off. But uh, he it says here that he retired after 35 years of service. He's with his wife, Mrs. Roy, and the former director of the museum, retired Admiral George George du Dufek or Dufek. I'm probably pronounced that wrong. D-U-F-E-K. 
But if there's any, if anyone out there is families of retired Admiral Dufek, we are sorry for mispronouncing his name. Now here's some other pictures of through the years of some of the men who worked. Some we do have names, some we do not, but we can identify here. As you can see, this is Mr. East sitting next to Haywood Roy. And that is Joseph Holland. Now, if you know any other men in this picture, as always, please contact us. Please, contact. we are looking for family members, descendants, neighbors, anyone that can let us know because we want to, you know, these are the men who have worked to keep us, who has given us the gift of the museum that we are now taking care of. And they took care of it before, and now we're taking care of it now. And we would like to know more about the men who has given us this gift. And here's another picture here of Mr. Roy sitting down labeled as head janitor. And going from the left to the right, Mr. Jacob Royal, James Massenberg, who was in the other picture, and another picture of Russell East. Now here's another picture of what they call the outside labor force. And we do have the names of some of the men. And again, we have Mr. Holland sitting next to, that looks like Mr. Sidney Birdsong. So these are some other pictures that we will get. Once again, we are going to research the men in this picture and contact families to get stories. And lastly, this is Anna Hyatt Huntington who was speaking with the men, as you can see, I'm a Mr. Is it? Which one? Right here. This one? I think so. This, the light is in my eye. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with that. Yeah. Okay. That looks like Mr. Holland and with his arms crossed in the white shirt, that is Russell East. And I'm not sure what room that is in. Can you tell what room that's in? It looks like it would have been what is now our speed and innovation. I'm just judging that by the, the artifact there. Okay. Pretty sure. Now what we want now, part of what we're doing, like I said, I've always said, you know, during this program, if you are a descendant, shout them out in the in the chat. If you know someone in the picture, please let us know that you that you know them. We like to have stories about them, information about them. And for an example, I like to show you one that we received. Now, this is a picture here to your left of Pink Moore in a beyond in a beyond years after the 1935 picture. And this is his wife to the right. Miss Lottie Moore, Lottie Williams Moore, and his son Willie Richard Moore. And in the picture to the left is his sisters, and to the right is his brother in his Masonic outfit. And that is his grandson and his granddaughter Joyce Moore Williams. And these pictures were courtesy of Miss Beatrice Moore Grenade. She is a ve very lovely lady to talk to, very, very pleasant. I enjoy talking to, I enjoy talking to all the families I've talked to, but you know, when she calls, it's very nice to talk to her. And I look forward to hearing her, to talking to her every time she calls. But Hidden Histories is not just limited to the photo of the men who built the museum. And as any good infomercial presenter would say, but wait, there's more. We do have other pictures and I like to share with them, share them with you right now. Now this picture is taken in 1918 at the Newport News Shipbuilding. This picture was printed in the ship in the shipbuilder bulletin 
1918, and this is of the Shipyard Safety Committee. Now, as you see, there is some African-American representation. They are standing at the top. We do have the names of those men because they were printed in the ship build, in the ship builder bulletin. And eventually we will reach out to their families also. This is a long process. So we're gonna get to you. If, you. if you're a family member of one of these men, don't worry, we will get to you. Might not be tomorrow, but very soon. So the Shipbuilder Magazine did highlight African-Americans in the shipyard. And there are other pictures of African-American representation on other committees, including the Employee Representation Committee. Now, this is another picture of African-Americans at the shipyard in the summer of 1919. This is during lunchtime. And as you can see here, if you think food trucks are a new innovation, it's, it was not. Because these are, this is a ice cream cart. And uh, that's, this another, looks like that's another ice cream cart. But this was during lunchtime. And again, we are starting to research African Americans in the shipbuilding. So stay tuned for that. I keep, you know, these some good previews. I, so y'all better stay tuned. Keep watching that website. Now, this picture here is, was taken in October of 1938, and it is the picture of the gentleman who attended the first meeting of the Retired Negroes Shipyard Club. These are all men who have retired from the Newport News Shipbuilding in 1938 or before. So many of these men started working at the shipbuilding when it first started, when it first opened. Now, let me introduce you to this handsome gentleman right there. That handsome gentleman name is Washington H. Grant. He is my great, great grandfather. He moved here from Charlotte County. He was actually, well, he was born enslaved in 1857, moved here from Charlotte County around late 1880s, early 1900s, took a job at the shipyard, retired from there, and he was active as a deacon at First Baptist Church Colored, which is now known as First Church Newport News off of 23rd and Wickham. I remember when you, when you emailed me this and said, can you check this for me? <laughs> And that was pretty exciting. Yes, it was, because my family, we did not have a clear photo of what we affectionately call, who we affectionately call Papa. We did not have a clear photo of him. So this is the only clear photo our family has of Papa. Oh, and one last thing I, want, I do want to say, if you look here at the top, this is what's taken at the Shipyard Community Center. This community center was built by the shipyard and it was located on the corner of 35th and Orchid, which is, if you go there now, it is a parking lot next to, I guess you want to call it the old Huntington Middle School building, because I think they're going to rebuild it, but we're not worried about that right now. Uh, so it's... So that's where it was located. And I do remember hearing some folks who were uh, graduates of Huntington said that this community center was used as their gym. Don't quote me on that. I think it was, because that's what they said. If you know something different, put it in the chat, let us know. Or if we were right, also let us know. Now the Hampton Roads area, was a major point of embarkation during World War I and World War II. Now, this is the first image of a few taken during that time. So this first picture is taken from Camp Hill, which was located around 64th Street near the shipyard. Here you have Lieutenant Morris Haynes. I think I pronounced that right, right here. That one? Yes. 
Colonel Frank Ahrens, and he is presenting the Honor Company plaque to First Lieutenant Olin McKinney and Captain Joseph Prather Jr. of the 3166 Service Company Unit. Now, many African Americans during World War II served in quartermaster units such as the 30, 3166. Now, this particular unit, I found out, is the unit that my grand uncle Clyde L. McAllister served in during World War II. And that's what brought him to the Newport News area and had him meet my aunt. And there's a great story that I, I found about both um, Lieutenant McKinney and Captain Prater that we will go into at another time because we will do also do a story, do a program on African-Americans in the military. So again, stay tuned. We got some great stuff coming up. I will really, I will subscribe to the email, like seriously. Now in this next picture is someone we all should know because of the movie, but this is Lieutenant Colonel, then Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin O. Davis Jr. of the Tuskegee Airmen. The troops that left out of Newport News either went to the European theater or the North African theater. And along with Lieutenant Colonel Davis, we also have a picture here of Lieutenant Colonel Wendell T. Derricks in the middle of the 597th Field Artillery Battalion attached to the 92nd Division. Now the 92nd Division was an all African-American division that fought in Italy against the Germans and their Gothic, Gothic line. If, you do, if you've ever seen the movie by Spike Lee, um, Miracle at St. Anna, that is a story about the 92nd Division in Italy. And also the 92nd Division was also the division that hosted, not hosted, where two gentlemen were a part of a Lieutenant Vernon Baker and a Sergeant John Fox. Those two men were actually honored during the Clinton administration with the Medal of Honor for Valor during their actions during World War II. And at that time, Lieutenant Baker was the only one living, but he has since passed away. Now recently, Newport News has celebrated Juneteenth. However, in the past, Newport News has celebrated Emancipation Day. Now Emancipation Day is, is, a, is an event that was celebrated by many African-American communities around the end of December, beginning of January, because of the Emancipation Proclamation being, being coming into effect on January 1st of 1863. So in this picture here, we have the parade and it's coming down Jefferson Avenue. Now, as you can see here, many of us should know this is the, that our natives of Newport News, this was the original church of First Church, which is located on 23rd and Wickham. And this is the Weeblos, Weblo, excuse me. As my, you know, my mother helped me out with this photo. Shout out to, shout out to moms. She helped me out with this photo because moms was lived around here. So this is Weblo's, and this is at the corner of 24th and Jefferson. So this picture is actually looking south on Jefferson Avenue towards 20, 24th and 23rd Street. And you actually a little bit right here of the Crown Savings Bank. Sign for that. Now this picture here is of the same parade, but now we're at the corner of 25th and Jefferson. Now, when you look at the when you look at the buildings, most of these buildings are no longer here, except this one. This building here is where currently where Esquire Barbershop. Shout out to Esquire, that's where I get my hair cut. That's where their barbershop is located. Most of the other buildings here have been torn down. 
but that is the one building that is still standing on 25th Street. And if you notice, which I thought was interesting, 25th Street was two ways. Now this last picture is at the end of the parade route, which was the Shipyard Community Center. Now I wanna highlight two gentlemen. The first one is Brigadier General John R. Kilpatrick. He was a commanding officer of the Hampton Roads Point of Embarkment, and he is the one who donated many of these pictures. And then second from the right, that right there is Mr. Solomon M. Travis Jr., who was one of the organizers of the celebration. Now, Mr. Travis is a well-known community leader who was one of the organizers of the Peninsula Shipbuilders Association, which was here before, which was the union in the shipyard before the steel workers. He was the president of the Whitaker Hospital, Whitaker Memorial Hospital Association, and served on the hospital's board of trustees. He raised funds for the construction of War Memorial Stadium, which is located off Pembroke Avenue in Hampton. And he was a member of the Newport News Peninsula, Newport News Planning Commission, excuse me, and selected as Citizen of the Century by the Bicentennial Commission of Newport News in 1976. And just as a note, I just saw this. You always had the one kid that sees the flash and had to look at the camera. <laughs> if you cannot tell, I have fun looking at these photos because I learned so much and I see so many things that connect us now to those in the past. So I have fun. I laugh at these. I learn. So if it's not an offense, I hope I'm not offending anyone by looking at these pictures and laughing at some of the things. I just noticed that kids will always be kids. Now we also have pictures like this, not only from the Hampton Roads area, but also from the Crestfield, Maryland area. Now Crestfield, Maryland is located on the Eastern shore of Maryland and was once the location of many crab, crab packing factories. As you see here, the crabs, are har the crabs are harvested from the bay and they're put on the table and the ladies are literally picking through the crabs and putting them into the can. I know some of us out there love to pick the crabs, but some people like me, I don't like to get my hands dirty when I eat crabs. So I am thankful to these ladies for doing the dirty work for me. Now, I found a very interesting story because the crab packing industry mainly employed African-American women who were paid a rate so much, so much cents for every gallon of crab they packed. So in the late 1930s, 700 crab pickers of which 600 were African-American decided to go on strike to protest the reduction in pay because their pay rate went from 35 cents a gallon. Now this was 19, this is the 1930s, so you can adjust for inflation. But it went from 35 cents a gallon to 25 cents a gallon. So they decided to go on a strike to protest that and work conditions. It is a great story that once again, we will present to you later. So you need to stay tuned to learn more about that. Also, if anyone in the audience has had a family member who actually did crab picking or oyster shucking or were crabbers or oystermen in, in the bay, please let us know that, let us know about that in the chat. Now these pictures here were taken by Ellis Parker Griffith. He was a, Mr. Griffith was a photographer who worked for the Newport News Shipbuilding from 1901 to 1948. Now, it was interesting when I saw these pictures because I've never seen, I didn't know what building this was in front of. I knew I had 2200 
And if we have any students who are not historians, we are doing, this is what historians do. So when I'm looking at this, I see a house, I see 2200, and I'm wondering, well, what is this? So I'm looking at the photos to see if there are anything about the photos that can give me some type of clue as to what I am looking at. Now, these photos are part of a set. So this next photo gave me the clue I was looking for. Now this photo here is a, a basketball team that was the 20th century champs, 1921-1922. So I did a research to see if I can find anything of a basketball team, an African-American basketball team in 1921-1922 that were champs. I didn't find, I couldn't find anything. However, there was a clue that helped me figure out where this was taken. the triangle. So when I looked up the triangle and athletics, I found- Oh, can I do this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Had to. <laughs> the YMCA. Yes, Lisa, the YMCA. And I found out from doing some searching in the Again, the Norfolk Journal and Guide that the Newport News YMCA, the colored YMCA in 1920s was located at 2200 Marshall Avenue on the corner of Marshall and 22nd Street. And this was actually before the shipyard YMCA was built. So again, we are looking, actively looking for information on this photo. If anyone, knows any information about the young men in this photo. Were they, were they YMCA athletes? Were they Huntington athletes? Who are they? Why, what tournament were they in that they were the 20th century champs? So please let us know if you know anything about, anything about this picture or anything about the YMCA when it was at when it was on the corner of 22nd and Marshall, let us know. And we will put our, con we have our contact information at the end. Now this photo here was taken by a Mr. Albert Durant. He was the first licensed African-American photographer in Williamsburg, James City County. Now, he was on the US, this is taken on the SS United States, which was built at the Newport News shipbuilding. Now I've seen this picture numerous times in preparing this, in preparing this presentation. And when I was sitting with Wisteria going over it, I looked and I said, oh my gosh, I know him. This gentleman right here, that is Mr. Eddie Jeffries Sr. He, well, I won't say we grew up together in church because he was a little bit older than me. But as a child, but he was one. But well, yeah. But as a child, he was one of the elders, elder statesmen at my church. And I spoke with his daughter, Miss Helen Williams, who I share a birthday with, by the way. She told me that he worked at the shipyard in the machine shop. And at that time he was in the machine shop when this picture was taken, there were a few African-Americans who worked there as a machinist because the machinist was a skilled labor position. In addition to working at the shipyard, he also worked at the hotel ward on his wait staff, which is possibly how he became chosen for the uh, United States trip. She, now, when talking, she wanted me to emphasize that he worked both of jobs and he was able to use the money he earned to send all his children to college where they all graduated and earned graduate degrees. So shout out to Mr. Jeffries. Now this second photo, I just had to show it because we looked at this 
And Wisteria and I was like, we're still looking at it. Like, it's just amazing. Cause all of us sit back. Cause I'm not a foodie, but yet she says she is. <laughs> but they always have the shows on the Food Network where people are making cakes, like great cakes that's, you know, of castles and whatnot. And we think this is new. It's not new. This is a cake that was made in 1952. Mm -hmm. And look at the detail look at of the, the ship and the windows. Lifeboats, the funnels. Yeah. Yes, that's a cake. We don't know what else to say. Exactly. It's cake. <laughs> That's just great. Now, if again, if anyone in the audience knows any of the men in these pictures, because like I said, we have no names. We just have pictures. So if you have somebody, if you have a relative that was on the ship, that was on a wait staff, or that you, um, you know, or, you, or you've been on the ship, possibly as a child or as an adult, if you're, in that age range, or you know of anyone that has worked there, neighbor, church member, uh, sorority member, fraternity member, anyone, please let us know. We are actively searching. And if you can tell us who made this cake, that'll be great because I need that recipe. Now, this is our last photo for the day. Sad face, I know. Now, those of us who are from Newport News have always known that the House of Prayer and the Gospel Spreading Church of Elder Mishaw always baptized people in the river. However, we found this picture of the baptism in the river off of what the community knows as Pinkett's Beach, but is officially known as King Martin Luther King Jr. Park from November 8th, 1914 by a Reverend C.E. Jones. Now this is very interesting. So that's Reverend Jones baptiz baptizing right there. So in my research, what I found was Reverend Jones was the pastor of, was the former pastor of Zion Baptist Church, which was located off of Ivy Avenue, but is now located on Jefferson Avenue, well, off of Jefferson Avenue on, I think, 20th Street now. So according to a paper written by another former pastor of Zion Baptist that some of the folks out there might know, Reverend L.T. Day, in his paper that's located at the Newsom House, Reverend Jones, Reverend C.E. Jones, would go into the bars and other places to bring people in for a weekend revival at Zion. And on Sunday after the church, after church, Reverend Jones would take them to have baptisms in the river, where some of the baptismal candidates were those that he found Friday night in the bar. So I will also tell you again, stay tuned because we will be doing something with something else more with this picture. So stay tuned, like this is gonna be really soon. So be sure to stay tuned to the Marriage Museum website and YouTube page for that. So now we come back to our mission statement, which is the Marriage Museum in part connects people to the world's waters because through the waters and through our shared maritime heritage, we are connected to one another. So with these, with these photos, I hope that you have seen how we are connected to, the, to each other and just the waters by just one of many avenues in which we are connected. Mm -hmm. And that those of us in the older generations, we do have an, we have an obligation to tell those in the younger generations where we have come from. So that way, when they are now in the older generation, they can do better than what we have done. So I thank you all. And just for those who are historians, these are my sources. Mm -hmm. 
And if you have any questions, we'll take them now. Jenna, do you, we have any questions in the chat or anything? I don't see anyone, y'all. Does anybody have any questions for Wisteria or Winston? What a great presentation, I have to say. I've been looking forward to this one for a long time, and I think we can all share. If you guys read those comments, everybody enjoyed this today. So great, great work, you two. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We're, we're very excited. And along with this, as we mentioned at the beginning, this is really kind of our kickoff to celebrating Black history. But as Winston has said several times, we're continuing with these stories throughout the year. So this is not the last time that you're going to see of us. So we do hope that you all join us uh, for several of the different Black History Month programs we have. We have everything from talking about uh, Doris Story Miller all the way to um, African-American storytelling and beyond. So we thank you all very much uh, for attending this presentation.